peeps, we're back. And I'm so happy to have you here today on Bibliophiles. I have a really special guest today, and she and I have an awful lot of wonderful things in common um, as far as our writing and other things like that. I've been reading her books and I love them. And uh, today we're going to talk, as usual, about the author's journey and how everybody has a different perspective of it but there are so many commonalities between all of us. And we're gonna talk about how, when you start this journey, that there's some momentum that builds, there's some things that you learn, and hopefully you'll learn a few tips and tricks about making your writing better or helping you to promote your writing or any of those things. You never know what's gonna happen on this show. So I want to introduce you to my guest today, Kristen Julius has these amazing books. And okay, so guys, you know me and dragons. They're, they've got dragons in them. Dragons, <laughs> yay! I love dragons. Anyway, so um, she's a fantasy writer. And welcome, Kristen. We're so glad to have you on the show. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for the warm welcome. I'm delighted to be here. And I'm delighted that we've made this connection so that I can be. Yes. it's it's. I think that's one of the funner things about being an author in this time is we are able to make so many more connections with other authors who are on the same journey and it's so helpful to be able to to do that it makes a, an amazing difference so tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you started in this crazy thing okay well i uh am writing under the the, the name of casey julius um, but i have uh, been a writer most of my life. I, I did publish. I'm, I'm a hybrid writer, so I did originally publish traditionally under the name of Kristen Julius, a young adult fantasy, um, many years ago um, in 2002. And then I was a full-time international educator, so I didn't have a lot of time to do writing full-time. Now I do. Um, I currently live in Germany, um, and I uh, started the Dryn Glennon Chronicles, which is my fantasy series. Um, it's an epic medieval sword and sorcery, intrigue, betrayal, a sprinkling of romance. Um, I actually started it in 2014 uh, while uh, I was living in the eastern part of Germany. Um, and it's been a it's been a over six year journey. Uh, and yeah, so I, I recently I've been rapid releasing these books and um, the first book came out in January, the second in February, the third in May, and the next the last of the series should come out at the end of August. It's so amazing and um, I have to tell you I am a, a, an extreme classical fantasy fan and these books have every aspect of classic fantasy. Um, but the interesting thing is you've given a lot of this some twists and turns that aren't really all that expected, especially um, some of your character. Your characters are young and um, or your main characters. Um, and then they've got all these side characters who are the wise people that are trying to help them and the other people who are really trying to not help them and, and give them all kinds of horrible issues <laughs> and and they're learning and they really don't know who they are yet you know yeah, I, yeah definitely say that it's uh, you know there is a coming of age element to the story uh my protagonists range with the exception of master morgan who's the wiser older wizard um range from at the beginning of the book they range from uh 18 to 13. um but uh even though it's a fantasy, my characters are have you know very human. They're they're people, and they uh, they have a lot of uh, with all their flaws, um, and they have a lot of obstacles in front of them. And many of them are those that they put in front of themselves. Uh, and so it's definitely you know a story not just about you know a, the the classic tropes of fantasy, but also about how they come into themselves. Right. And that's one of the things I noticed about 
um, your books is each of the characters um, are both flawed and exceptional in different ways. And they have so many um, completely and utterly different viewpoints based on where they were raised, their, their status in the society that they live in and all this kind of stuff. And yet they all have the same yearnings and desires to, you know, to have all the things that we all want out of our lives. Um, and, and they really and truly don't understand their own value. And I think one of the things that you bring out in these books is that exploration of who you really are based on who you think you are or who other people may have convinced you that you are. And I really love that about your books. No, well, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to hear this. Um, I know that um, even though uh, I set the books uh, in a, the late, in my mind, in the late uh, 15th century, and I did a lot of research around that era um, so that, you know, I knew about the armaments, the ships, the clothing, sure. the foods, the building materials. Um, but at the same time, I brought in elements of today's world because many of the issues that are involved, for example, with the Olivari people, or um, there's discrimination and the struggle for parody with, um, I have you know, two strong female protagonists, uh, Mora and Hala, who are trying to find their way in a male-dominated society. Uh, so a lot of the issues are, even though it's set in the, you know, the medieval times, um, are issues that we're still displaced people, you know, that we're still, we're still grappling with today. Sure, absolutely. And I think the other thing is that uh, I noticed in your books is this business of so much of it is just about communication. Everybody has their own thoughts and ideas, and so many of them are just skewed just enough that they really and truly don't understand what the other people are doing. And so they make assumptions based on stuff that's not real. And that's what causes a lot of the conflict is that this person assumes that people, these, this particular group of people is this way and, and, and generalizes those people, you know, the, uh, by the acts of like a single person, maybe even in a, a past history, you know, that, that happened so long ago that they don't even really remember it straight. And then this other group of people thinks that the other people are the bad guys because, and they've got a list of those kinds of things. And I see that in our lives today. Um, I think that it's been brought into sharp focus in the past few months even that we need to learn to communicate better and be willing to learn about the other person without making assumptions. I mean, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons that um, the second book, A Realm at Stake, begins actually with the, the Helgren Society, which is um, in Dring Glennon is perceived as being, you know, barbaric. They're, absolute en enemies and um, you know the the antagonism between um, the two peoples is based on age-old um, grievances right. and uh, so I really enjoyed being able to tell from a different point of view that people you know we all have so many things that are, are many more things that we hold in common than sure, we do absolutely. those things that you know, separate us um, because and it isn't until there is some one-on-one -on -one communication and an opportunity to actually observe the real, what's really going on, that people start realizing, hey, maybe this isn't what we thought it was. I um, actually uh, found myself thinking them like the gypsy people who were for so many hundreds of years considered thieves and liars and all these kinds of things. They were, you know, I mean, there probably were some of those, and the whole group got painted with that brush, you know, and we do that, unfortunately, way more than we ought to. 
Well, as you, as you referred, you know, before to the stereotypical, you know, ideas that people form about a group of people um, and are unfortunately passed down. Mm -hmm. um, and there used to be, when I was growing up, a commercial on television, and I don't recall, or a public service message, I don't recall who put it out, but it was, you have to be um, very carefully taught to hate. It has to be drummed in your dear little ear. Um, yes. The whole idea that these prejudices are, are, are taught mm -hmm. and reinforced um, with, you know, slurs and daily uh, misassumptions that are passed on uh, right. generation, generationally, unfortunately, very unfortunately. Yes, and, uh, and it's about time we started figuring out that human beings are human beings wherever they live, and even though some of their traditions might be different than ours, and some of their ideas and beliefs might be different than ours, or anything else is different about them. I mean, there are other kinds of pockets of people that have nothing to do with race or culture. People who are mentally slow or physically challenged in so many different ways or disfigured in some way or, you know, I mean, there's a big long list of things where people make snap judgments based on appearances. You know, and I think that it's wonderful that your books address that in such an entertaining way. The, the books, the, the story them, the itself is absorbing and, and makes you feel like you want to know what happens next. You start to really care about these characters and feel for them and recognize, oh, it's too bad they feel this way about this person over here or this group of people over there because it's so not true because you, you get to peek in behind the curtain um as part of the way that you constructed your story and i just really love that about your books so oh, as as authors do we have a responsibility then when we write to create stories that bring up topics that make people think about these kinds of things well i i certainly hope that it would be one of our goals no question. Um, I certainly, and I also know that having lived, as you have, around the globe in many different cultures, um, it's definitely influenced uh, my perception, not only of my, my writing, but my perception of the world and of human nature. Mm -hmm. And um, as I said before, that, you know, that there are so many things that we, you know, we all love our children, we all want what's best for, you know, our families. Um, most almost all of us want, want to be good people um, right. and, and what we believe or what we, uh, you know, how we dress or uh, that shouldn't influence our interactions and understanding of people who don't dress like us or uh, practice the same faith, um, that we should seek those common, commonalities and celebrate those differences. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's one of the glorious things about human beings is they are all so different. And that's what enriches just the world. Um, uh, my books cover a kind of a different sort of a setting and it's, it's different dimensions and different kinds of intelligent beings um, out there. And uh, it's real. And, and one, one of the issues that gets addressed is a judgment that takes place based on not understanding the true facts, the background behind things, and um, the adjustment of the attitudes of some of the characters in the um, book and like that. And I think that um, I love the fact that people love my books because they're entertaining, but what really thrills me is when one of my readers comes back and says, I get what you're trying to do there. I like, you know, what you're teaching through this. I, the, the, the story is great and the characters are fun, but I get it. And that really makes me happy because that's my hope. I, I noticed I am a big fan of J.K. Rowling, as most people know. And one of the things I really appreciate about her books is how she is able to do this really exciting, amazing, fun story and yet teach some really important principles about how people should treat one another. And uh, I really always appreciated that. So let's talk a little bit about the author journey. Now you said, you know, it took you a while to finally 
you know, put it all together, but now you're rapid fire publishing these books. What was the one thing that surprised you most when you finally held that book in your hand? I mean, you've got this book, it's got your name on it, it's got words inside of it, it's a real honest to goodness thing. There you go. Oh, and, and by the way, congratulations on your award winning covers. I oh, love my cover artist. He's amazing, but I just think it's so wonderful that you've won all those prizes. I do have to flash them. I, I mean, Gwen Shackleton is a very talented British artist. These are the first book covers she's ever done and probably will be the last. <laughs> it was a little bit more than she had anticipated, but um, they, they have, uh, you know, I'm, I love them. And I, you know, I think they have a big impact on uh, book sales because they're just so beautiful. <laughs> and they're very enticing and intriguing. And I, I really love the covers. But so getting back to the um, question that I interrupted myself. Um, uh, Both jumped in. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. Um, what is the one thing that surprised you most when you realized, okay, that you weren't done when the book came out? Well, I have to be honest and say that um, because I waited uh, to publish the first book until the fourth book, the last book of the series, at least was um, in rough draft form completed. Mm -hmm. uh, I had during that time, because I'd made the decision to make the leap from traditional to independent publishing, I had spent a part of every day learning about how to be an author or entrepreneur. Um, and so, which is the, the, the term that is used by the Alliance of Independent Authors, of which I'm a member, and I cannot sing their praises. They're highly. amazing. Just an amazing That's organization. That's how we made the connection. Yeah, I mean, any, any writer, regardless of where you are in your journey, I highly recommend that you, um, you know, get in, uh, become a member of this organization. It's not very expensive, and it's the resources, the wealth of resources, and the wonderful people um, and connections that we've made. It's just, it's, it's been my, my ballast through, through yeah. this journey. Um, I still Definitely have a lot. Definitely worth the investment, for sure. <laughs> Yeah. So um, I wasn't really, you know, I knew that once the book was out, I was just beginning. And I'm still, I, I, tell, I told my husband, uh, we've completed the first mile of this marathon. Uh, and that's with almost the fourth book out. Uh, mm -hmm. but, the, but the whole journey is still stretching ahead. I've just gotten, I just started uh, in, at the end of May, I started my first paid advertising. Uh, and I've learned a lot about that in the process. I had a, I had a featured deal on on BookBub, and that was another amazing experience as part of the journey. Um, and you had also mentioned about, um, you know, maybe talking a little bit about the contests uh, because I think that those are also an experience that um, contributed to my learning more about my writing and about uh, how to better promote my work. So, so what's your most favorite and least favorite thing about being an author? Uh, there's very little that I don't like. I waited a long time to be able to do this full time. So uh, I, I, I really love, I really love the writing life. Uh, I, I wish that I had a little bit better handle on the whole uh, analyzing data. <laughs> oh. So that, that's probably my biggest challenge. Um, but that's I'm the not... entrepreneur side of what yeah. you do. It's necessary yeah. if you're going to self-publish. Yeah, It's absolutely necessary. Even yeah. if you are publishing traditionally, you can't get away without marketing your books if you want to sell any. Yeah, I think it's a big, uh, I think it's a big mis, um, misapprehension that if you publish traditionally that the, the publishing house will handle your marketing. Unless you're J.K. Rawlings or Stephen King or John Grissom, you, you do all of your own marketing. Or, or, and, the, and the drawback when you're traditionally published is that you need permission, um, you know, what, what and how you can market. Whereas if you're an independently publishing author, it's up to you. 
even even little things like your um, book covers they get chosen for you you have no say yeah um and and so when i looked at i did the research <laughs> you know and i looked at the pros and cons i decided that first of all my first book got published two weeks before my 65th birthday i didn't want to wait six years for my first book to come out so my own personal <laughs> impact i'm a literary agent <laughs> right exactly yeah. and so all of that and then when you um add to that the restrictions i also wanted to have complete rights to all of my materials um, I always put all rights reserved uh, on everything that I do because I see that there's some potential that maybe, I don't know, there might be a movie and merchandising in my future. Absolutely. And if that's the case, I need to have the right to do what I want. Now, I'm totally willing to take some um, counsel from people who know better, and I'm willing to hire mentors um, to help me along this route, but it's, it's certainly not about. Um, me just turning it over to somebody else and kind of relieving myself of really the responsibility of marketing. Well, I think you you hit on the, the one word people say, you know, in one word, why did you decide to become an independently publishing author? And that's control. Mm -hmm. um, it's control, as you said, of the content, the covers, your copyright, you retain uh, uh, the longevity of the work. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't get pulled off the shelves in six months and no one ever sees it again. It, I mean, when you're independently publishing, it just, it's, it has a lifespan as long as it goes. Um, and also you reap more of the financial benefits. It's very so, true. um, yeah, I think control is, is the, you know, the main, the main driving force and the main, and, and I also, I generally say that I'm independently publishing rather than self publishing because I believe when I made the decision to go this route, I said, my, I promised myself and my readers that my work would receive the same sort of professional handling that it would get a publishing house. So it's not a self done job. I, you, you hire professional sure. designers, you hire professional editors. I have a cartographer who does beautiful maps. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a formatter. I had someone help me design a professional help me design my website. And so it's a it's a team effort. Yes. Yeah. No writer is an island. Yeah. <laughs> Not if they want to sell any books anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. So, okay, well, um, if you could give just one tip that you think has really made the most difference for you as an author to our aspiring authors out there, we have a lot of people who want to be and haven't quite done it yet. They might even be partway through their book or whatever, and they're just, they're hesitant, or for whatever reason, there might be something holding them back. What is the one thing that you could tell them, or if you could go back to your personal writer self in your beginnings, that you would like to tell uh, our peeps here today? Okay, I always, I always have three, but... Um, oh, three, uh, three will work. Okay, and um, well, one of them is a piece of advice. This is a piece of writing advice that I got from David Gatewood, who is calls himself my copy line editor, but he's so much more. Um, and it is when you're writing a scene, when you're writing a chapter, that you arrive late and you leave early. And what he means by that is that your reader should not have to wade through a big introduction to get to the what is going to actually happen in this chapter. And on the, conversely, at the other end of that chapter, or, or John Marston used to say, start with the war, but it, start with the action. Then at the end, if you end your chapter with, and then she went to sleep or he you know, went to bed, um, your reader may want to do the same. You have to leave your reader wanting more. So mm -hmm. that's, that's one good tip that um, I've been given. I think you hit on, I'm trying to think of what the third one was, but okay, I'll just go with, I, I think you hit on the most important thing. Um, and that is you need to get your work read. You need to have, and you need feedback on your work. And it can be terrifying to put your work out and have other people criticize it or make comments on it. And I, I, I add a caveat to this is that not everyone is going to like your work. 
Uh, hmm. It's again, not everyone likes my work. If, you, if you're not a fantasy reader, and I have friends say, oh, I actually haven't read that yet. But if, if they don't read fantasy, there's no point in even picking it up. But you should find beta readers who love the genre. You should have, your editors should be people who are, are mainly in your genre. If you write romance, don't, don't give your book to a thriller you know, editor. You want to find someone who is you know, passionate about the genre and, and, then, and then you have to be open for constructive criticism and you, and you need to, you know, you need to take in what your readers think because they're, you know, they're your model readers and other readers, if they don't like what you're doing or they say they don't understand or this didn't work for them, it's likely it's not going to work for other readers either. Absolutely. So getting, getting your work out, I think that's... I love my beta readers. They are so awesome. And I yeah. have to say that that was the agreement we had from the beginning, is they would be kindly honest with me and I would pay attention to everything they said and then make a decision as to whether it was something that I was going to do because not every suggestion is um, a suggestion that fits for you. But that being said, you always need to pay attention um, to what people are saying and ask yourself, is this a change that needs to be made? And if it isn't, you're going to know because you know those characters and what's going to happen next sure. better than your beta readers do. Um, and sometimes there's method to your madness, so to speak. But the, the one thing that you always need to be is very um, uh, openly grateful to them for taking, making the time to do the reading and take the notes that they take and all of those things. I couldn't have published these books. Without Absolutely them. labor of love. I mean, I just, uh, and my, my very best beta reader is my son who's 27 years old and is in my target audience mm -hmm. range. Um, and a, and a, a very good writer in his own. Um, uh, and, and he, you know, he's invaluable. We, we, I don't think I could have finished this last book without his, you know, without his feedback and, mm -hmm. uh, and um, suggestions that, that have made the work so much stronger. So right. it, I it think definitely that, does. Very, that's probably the biggest thing that you, it, it's a, it's a risk. Um, but as a writer, you know, that's a risk you, you want to take. You want your work to be understood. Absolutely. And I think of it a lot like um, the uh, group, the Inklings, with Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and the like. Um, yeah. That kind of a collaboration. And one of the things, <laughs> one of the things um, that I um, love about being an author in these times is the support structure that I have from other authors. I'm, I'm involved in several authors groups. Um, uh, the two main ones are NaNoWriMo, which is what gave me my start and got me into the habit of writing every day and set my work ethic for what I'm doing now. And then um, Allie was suggested to me um, by Richard Lowe and uh, went in there and I was just really kind of getting started. I was almost ready to publish when I started with them. And I was so appreciative of the fact that there's just a complete lack of competition. Absolutely. You know, it's, it it's was all about, all about giving and sharing and, and um, oh, you can do this. You can do this. You know, and, yeah. you know, cheerleaders and, yeah. um, and the opportunity to also give back. The give and take that happens there is really wonderful. Chris, uh, Kristen, I really, really thank you for coming. Um, you've got rainbows. That's so oh, cool. <laughs> the sun, we're at different, you know, we're at different times. My sun's going down. Yours is coming up. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it's, uh, a little bit of rainbow. Let's see if I can. Yeah, there it's really cool. It's, no, it's, it's fine. Um, it was actually kind of a cool effect. Um, but at any rate, yeah, small payload. <laughs> I really appreciate you coming and, and um, playing with us today. And um, when 
um, you get your next book out. Um, there's some other things that I would love to discuss with you at that time. Will you come back and visit with us again? I would be honored. That Thank would be you so awesome. much. I really enjoyed this time with you, and I'm, I'll look forward to the next one. And I hope it's what I hope I gave something that is of value to your to your viewers. I I loved our discussion, and I'm sure we have discovered that we have a lot of things in common over the this uh, period of time since we've known each other. And um, I'm sure that there will be other discussions uh, in the future about a number of different things. All right, peeps. How amazing is this? This is just so much fun. And you're starting probably to recognize some commonalities. When we talk to all these different authors, are you hearing that voice that tells you that you can do this? Are you hearing that voice that says, just get started or don't quit? We're all on the same journey together and you have so much wonderful stuff ahead of you. Please, you know, get the book out, take notes. Next week, we're going to be talking with a copy editor. We were talking about, you know, beta readers and all the people that are on your team. And she's brilliant. Um, and she's going to teach us a lot about formatting and about how important it is to have somebody else, some more eyes on your copy, and some of the things you can do to prevent, you know, your copy editor taking much longer to edit your copy than they need to. So she's got some great tips, and I'm really looking forward to that interview. Thank you, uh, and, uh, and I really, really appreciate you. KC Julius, and the website's right here, okay? Go and check her out. Check out those amazing covers and take a look at those books. If you love fantasy, I'm here to tell you, this is a good one. All right, there we okay, go. Thank you so much, Bonnie. You're welcome. All right, bye, bye everybody. Take bye. care.